2015, pela primeira vez na ciência, nós observamos ondas gravitacionais. Ondas gravitacionais são, é uma ideia que já vem de, de, de muito tempo atrás, mas para chegar a esse ponto foi necessário desenvolver a, a equipamentos extremamente sofisticados e essa descoberta foi feita por uma por um observatório chamado LIGO, LIGO em português, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Waves Observatory. O anúncio formal desse, a, dessa descoberta foi feito em fevereiro de 2016. É interessante que essa, essa, a previsão de como é que seria o sinal observado quando buracos negros se fundem, a gente vai encontrar um brasileiro na origem disso, Jaime Tchomno, nos anos 70. Quando foi anunciado, eu estava em Brasília, no, eu lembro que assistia o anúncio num, num uh, um shopping center, né? aí quando eu vi o nome do, do, de uma das pessoas que estava associada à a, a descoberta, disse, não tem jeito de ser americana, deve ser alguma pessoa um pouquinho mais próxima da nossa. O, quem liderava esse grupo, o Laser Interferometer Gravitation Wave, vai ser a nossa próxima palestrante, Gabriela Gonzalez. Mas eu gostaria ainda de comentar algumas coisas antes disso. Quer dizer, um pouco depois disso, essa, esse primeiro anúncio teve uma repercussão fantástica na, na imprensa, né? mas um pouco depois disso, ah, já em outubro de 2017, foi observada a fusão não de buracos negros, mas de estrelas de nêutrons. E isso teve um... um um efeito muito interessante, porque isso foi, foi possível observar não apenas com esse instrumento, não, não apenas as ondas gravitacionais, gravitacionais, mas outras consequências. Como, por exemplo, o, o, você vê no, em, em, em observatórios astronômicos, como, por exemplo, em detetores de neutrinos. E é interessante que no anúncio dessa fusão de, de a, estrelas de nêutrons, uma brasileira estava associada, quando foi feito o, o anúncio, uma brasileira que é pouquíssimo conhecida, Marcele Soares dos Santos. Uma brasileira, uma física nascida no sul do Pará, estudou no sul do Pará, depois foi à USP, hoje está nos Estados Unidos. Curiosamente, é muito pouco conhecida aqui. Mas o, o mais importante do, do, dessa descoberta é que a líder do, do grupo do LIGO, o LIGO é, uma, uma, é um experimento com cerca de mil pessoas, pelo menos, mil, mil cientistas, e a gente não abertamente, mas física ainda é uma, uma male-oriented science. Né? Então, a Gabriela Gonçalves liderar mais de mil cientistas não é uma tarefa muito pequena. Ela é professora na Louisiana State University, a, a, em Baton Rouge, na, na, na Louisiana. Ela a, é nascida em Córdoba, ela fez o, a graduação dela em Córdoba, depois do doutorado nos Estados Unidos. E a, ao longo dos últimos anos, desde essa descoberta, ela recebeu vários prêmios, eu não vou listá-los, que é uma lista bastante impressionante, mas, em particular, ela faz parte da a, a Academia de Ciências dos Estados Unidos, a Academia de Artes a, e Ciências também dos Estados Unidos. Ela recebeu a, a Einstein Medal, também em 2017, e, em 2016, ela foi considerada uma das dez pessoas mais importantes a, a, em ciência pela revista Nature. Né? O, quando foi feito o anúncio da, 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 da fusão de estrelas de nêutrons, vários experimentos, inclusive eu faço parte de um dos papers que, a, que observa isso. Isso abriu uma nova área na, na, em astronomia, que é, o, que é a área dos multi-messengers, a, 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 Uh, experiment, né? O, mas só para dizer, não dá muita importância ao, ao, a minha participação nisso. A minha universidade, na lista de, de uh, instituições que participam desse paper, tem o um número 979. É um pouco para se tornar ver um pouquinho mais relevante o, o, esse papel da gente. Mas a, a, a Gabriela Gonzalez vai nos contar então como é que foi o processo todo de construção. Do, do, do equipamento para poder medir ondas gravitacionais e, e como é que foi todo o processo a posteriori. Né? Então, agradeço a sua presença aqui, aceitar esse convite da academia e o auditório é seu. Obrigada. 
Thank you. Well, first of all, let me thank the organizers, the Academy, not only for inviting me this year, but <laughs> for inviting me this year after failing to come last year. <laughs> so <laughs> this was a high risk invitation because all the logistics last year <laughs> was my fault. <laughs> uh, so I hope it's some gain. I want to tell you, uh, like it was said about the about uh, this wave, and I thought I was going to have a pointer here, but about this wave that you see in there and the history of that wave that we physicists like to say it is a milestone in the science, in the history of science, but let's see how it goes. Uh, I also would like to say that I have enjoyed very much listening to lectures today it's not the kind of lectures I listen to when I go to conferences. Uh, but even though I'm going to tell you now about the general theory of relativity, I think this talk is going to be the lightest and most optimistic of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start. This is a long history. I could start a billion years ago, but I'm going to start only 100 years ago. And that's when Einstein published in 1915 his theory of general relativity, which sounds very mysterious, but it's just a theory of gravity. It's a theory that explains the force of gravity, not the way we learn it in school, which is a lot easier, but with a very, very complicated theory that makes the gravitational interaction not instantaneous. He had come up with this universal speed of uh, universal speed limit, the speed of light. Nothing traveled by faster than the speed of light, but gravitational interaction, according to Newton, did travel instantaneously. That's faster than the speed of light. So he came up with this theory that uh, says that masses we all live in what he called a space-time. And the way I like to imagine space-time is a three-dimensional grid that measures distances with little clocks in the corners that are all synchronized, and that's the space-time, and that's still what we use as space-time in most of physics. But what Einstein said is that if there is a mass in that space-time, that changes the distances and the times. It makes the distances a bit longer, the clocks run a bit slower, it changes this structure of space-time. And we like to represent it a bit like this. But the importance of this is that if there is another mass, if you imagine that being the sun, and there is another mass, like the Earth, and the Earth is coming not towards directly towards the sun, but at some, at some angle, then it's not going to go straight, not because it feels a force, but it, because it sees space-time changed. It just follows the shortest path, the shortest path in this curved space-time. So that's how Einstein explained the theory of gravity, and this theory had a lot of consequences that were developed over the years, it was in uh, one of the first things he calculated is how light travels in a, not in a straight path, but in a, in a curved path. And that could be proved by an eclipse. And in 1919, there was a team with, including Brazilian astronomers, that um, worked on measuring light from an eclipse here in Zobral. Uh, and that was a full total, uh, total solar eclipse, and that appeared in the papers, not in the first page, but it appears in the papers saying astronomers, physicists now believe Einstein's theory. This was the proof he was looking for. But he was, he, uh, there were several other predictions. In 1916, he calculated the prediction of production of rotational waves. If you have two stars, they around each other because now there is gravity. It's Einsteinian gravity, but it's still gravity. So the two stars are going to rotate around each other. And these, this curvature of space-time are now going to be ripples. And they're going to travel. And they're going to travel at the speed of light. And they're going to carry energy away. So these two stars 
are going to get closer and closer together. That was a very definite prediction, the ripples of space-time and the stars getting closer together. But in Einstein put some numbers in there and said, this effect is negligible. And from that time on, people thought that it was just a mathematical curiosity, that it was not going to be ever measured because the effect was really, really, really small. Now, what produces gravitational waves? Uh, the Earth going around the sun, we moving around, but these effects are so small that even now we cannot think of technology that could measure these. So we have to look for objects that are very compact, that they have a lot of mass, but very, very compact and move very fast. And what are those? Those are astrophysical objects. For example, supernova explosions, and that was supposed to be a movie starting automatically, but it's not. Yeah, let me go back. Sorry about the movies. I hope the others work. If not, maybe I can ask people back there to start them. Supernova explosions, this is when stars explode, uh, they produce a shock wave here in, in, in space time, and that would produce gravitational waves. They would be short because they would, do, they would happen during the explosion. We cannot model them very well, but we think that they are very small unless the supernova is very close, like in our galaxy. These supernova explosions, some of these supernova explosions leave behind a pulse, a, a neutron star, which is the most compact of stars. It's like the mass of the sun concentrated in the size of a small city, not like Rio or Sao Paulo, but more like, more like Rosario in, Argenti in Argentina <laughs> or Baton Rouge. Some of those, or most of these neutron stars are known to rotate. If they are not perfectly spherical, and they are quite spherical, but if they are not perfect, and nothing is, then they would produce periodic gravitational waves. And we could look for those too. But those are also very small, unless the, the star is very close to us. It is periodic, so the longer we observe, the, long, the better we are. If we have two of these stars together, and this is a case we know exists in our galaxies, then they are going to merge and merge into a black hole. Two neutron stars merge and give birth to a hole. I like to think about that as a very romantic tango, <laughs> ending in an embrace and a black hole as a child. That would produce gravitational waves. And these are the ones we can cast. We know that the, the waves would be, uh, in the beginning, slow, and then they would increase in frequency and amplitude. And then once the black hole or the final star is formed, they would stop because there is a, or they would become very, very small and periodic, depending on what's a final object. This was the target that people began thinking about in the 70s, these and supernovas. And this is because the, there is at least one in the, discovered in the 70s and several other systems afterwards of pulsars, binary pulsars in our galaxy that were seen getting closer together, like Einstein predicted. So we knew gravitational waves existed. We just needed to be able to measure the small amplitude. And just to put some numbers in, in there, there are dimensionless numbers, which is a crime in physics, but we do it anyway. Uh, and this, what this curve represents is the change in distance over the baseline, because we're measuring space-time. We could also think about changes in time, but let's think about changes in distance that are a bit more intuitive. So the distance between you and I would be changing, even though you and I are not moving, the distances, the distance between you and I would be changing and getting longer and shorter, longer and shorter, like that wave. And then it would happen faster and faster and faster, and then it would stop. Now, how big is that change in distance? 
Well, one prediction is that it depends on the baseline you are measuring. The longer the baseline, the, long, the larger the effect. So let's think about the long distance. Distance between the Earth and the Sun, that's long. That distance would change due to the coalescence of two neutron stars in, let's say, the Virgo cluster. In our galaxy, it happens very, very rarely, like once every 10,000 years. In the Virgo cluster, it happens once every 50 years. So for that event, that distance between the Earth and the Sun would change by about an atomic diameter. And if you measure a smaller distance, it would, it would make the change even smaller. So Einstein, of course, was not wrong in saying that this was going to be very difficult to measure. Many other people were wrong in saying it was impossible. Another kind of, gravi of sources of gravitational waves is the early universe. After the Big Bang, there, were, there was this soup of particles. They all had mass. This was not completely homogeneous, so this early universe had gravitational waves in there. And they have been traveling, they exist even now. We could be within the book of the early universe if we could observe those gravitational waves. And they look like noise, so they are much more difficult to detect, except that they are everywhere. And we have learned to see, to read this book of the early universe in the microwave spectrum. If you don't know what that map is, you should, look, you should Google it up. It's a microwave, the cosmological microwave background, and it's one of the greatest discoveries in astronomy. And that's what we want to do in the gravitational wave spectrum. So there are lots of systems that produce gravitational waves. The question is how to measure it, how, how to make this measurement so precise. And the idea in the 70s was to use interferometry. In, in interferometry, you have a laser that split into two paths. You might remember a laser is a wave, an electromagnetic wave, a light wave. It bounces in the two mirrors that are farther away. The beams come back. They combine and get out of the interferometer. And if the, the two distances are exactly the same, the beams cancel, the waves cancel at the output. So if we put a the photodiode there, we see no light. But if the distances are changing, because there is a gravitational wave coming, and if there is a gravitational wave, one would get longer, the other shorter, then in the photodiode, we would see more light, less light, more light, less light. We would be seeing a gravitational wave. That was the idea. But again, you want to measure a fractional change in distance of a part in 10 to the 21. Those are 20 zeros followed by a one. <laughs> That's very small. However, people in the 70s thought that if you had a baseline long enough, kilometers long, and you develop technology that didn't exist quite at the time, but it would probably exist in about 10 years, 10 years later, then you could get, it done, get this done. And it was uh, Ray Weiss, an experimentalist in, in MIT, who thought about using interferometry. He was not the only one, but he was the one to calculate how sensitive could a detector be. And uh, Kip Thorne, a famous theorist working with black holes at Caltech, that worked on this, made of this as a, as a joint project between Caltech and MIT, which in general do collaborate. They usually compete with each other, but <laughs> they got these institutions to collaborate and ask the National Science Foundation to build not one, but two of these detectors that were four kilometers long on the side. This was an expensive project. It was actually studied for several years before being approved in the 80s. And even when it was approved, it was known that it was going to be a long-term project because it was not only going to take years in building, it was also probably going to take a first generation and the second generation. So when you talk about long-term planning in science, this is what that is, <laughs> long-term planning. 
This project was approved in the early 90s. The observatories were built in the early 90s. The detectors were made. The initial generation of the detectors were made to work in the 2000s, in the mid 2000s. And as you heard, we discovered gravitational waves only in 2015. So it took a lot of time and a lot of people. Not just them too, but they were the ones who started this. It's happening in the US, this LIGO project, but this was also happening in other places. In Europe, there were two groups, a German, um, a German British group called GEO and a French Italian group called Virgo that also thought about using interferometers. They actually had more experience using some other previous technologies for detecting gravitational waves that was not quite as sensitive. So this was something that was seen as a global trend. We are talking about trends, globalization. I can repeat some of the words that were used today. And they were kind of competitive in the beginning. But as time passed, as we all these, uh, all these projects began building detectors, Virgo is three kilometers long in Italy, GEO is 600 meters long. It was going to be kilometers long, but then re reunification happened in Germany. Budgets got a bit short, so the detector also got a bit shorter. So these, um, uh, as we got together, as we got talking about building these detectors, as, as we were developing the technology, we in really collaborating not just as a ground root technological level, but on taking the data together, on creating a collaboration together, and that was the beginning of this LIGO scientific collaboration that I'll tell you more about later. It not only happens in Europe and in the US, now it's a detector um, in construction in Kagra, and there is a detector in, it was planned in India, in India this slide, it was very nicely done, but it was done actually during the discovery in 2015, and Virgo was not yet of operational. In 2016, it became operational, so I had to fudge a bit the colors in there. LIGO India had not quite been approved. Now the land is built, uh, the land is bought, and there is an observatory construction about to happen, so things are happening. It is a global world. Now, this is the only technical slide that I'm going to post. I think it's the only one. <laughs> and it, this represents how we measure the sensitivity of our detectors. What we measure in that photodiode, it's not a flat line that becomes alive when we have a gravitational wave. What we actually measure is noise all the time. All the time, these distances are changing a little bit and they are changing at different frequencies by different amounts. At low frequencies, this is, a, this is a plot that shows the noise in fractional change in distance, and remember we wanted to do 10 to the minus 21 or so, so those are the numbers on the left, the numbers on the bottom are the frequency at which we measure that amount of noise, and the black curve that you see, the black noise curve, is a real noise curve that we took with LIGO detectors in 2010 with the best of what we had with the initial generation of detectors. And it tells you that at low frequencies, the noise rises very quickly. That's due to seismic noise. At high frequencies, the noise rises a bit more slowly. That's due to the quantum noise in the laser light that we use. And in the middle, well, we have usually lots and lots of things, but our fundamental limit there would be the Brownian motion of the mirrors that we put in here. And as I told you, the construction was of this first generation, which some of us were hoping would lead to this early discovery of gravitational waves. You had to be an optimist. It didn't, but that was not quite a surprise, and we're ready with this advanced LIGO technology to install. And that's the black curve that you see at the bottom that is less noise, that means more sensitive. With this initial generation of LIGO, we could see a binary neutron star merger to about the Virgo cluster distance, which I told you before. That was the goal, and we achieved it. Took us some time, but we got there. But that 
event only happens once every 50 years or so. So we wanted to be 10 times better, to see 10 times farther so we could see these events and other things perhaps. So we installed better seismic isolation to make the seismic noise better. We reduced the Brownian notion with clever techniques, not with cryogenics. And we reduced the quantum noise, essentially using more photons and more power. Now, we have not gotten to that black line yet. We are still working on that. These things, these experiments take years to make them work at the sensitivity that you want. But in 2015, we were in between these things. We were three times better than we were in initial LIGO. Now, this may not mean that to you, but what you need to do to get the sensitivity takes a lot of technology. First, you have to put the, mirror, the lasers in vacuum. So these four kilometer L-shaped observatories are vacuum tubes. These are some of the largest vacuum systems in the world, and this is high vacuum technology. We need a laser that was actually developed in Germany for the, for advanced LIGO that's got to be about 200 watts instead of 20 watts and the most stable laser in amplitude and frequency of the world. The mirrors are not just simple mirrors that are bolted to an optical table that you might have seen in some laboratory. It is, these are mirrors that are this big, they're 40 kilograms heavy, and they are hanging in quadruple pendulums because the simple pendulum that you might remember from school actually turns out to be a very good isolator of seismic noise. So we simple pendulums, quadruple pendulums in advanced LIGO. And we do that, we put that hanging from a active seismic platform in which we measure the displacement between the layers and we cancel it. That's what you see down at the bottom. And we put it all together in two places, <laughs> in Hanford, Washington, in the, north, uh, in the northwest in the US, and in Livingston, Louisiana, very close to Baton Rouge, where I live, which is why I live in Baton Rouge. I love Baton Rouge, but <laughs> this is the reason why I'm there. A huge amount of technology. And this, to make this work at the sensitivity that we want, and to analyze the data, to look for all those gravitational waves, it really needs a lot of people working together people of different specialties, physicists, engineers, students, professors, young women, older men. The opposite doesn't quite happen, but <laughs> we need all working together from many different countries. Now, it was February 11, 2016, when we could say we did, now the time at which the gravitational wave we observed went through Earth, it was November 14, 2015. Somebody has proposed this as the International Day of Science. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> I actually, I liked, although we didn't plan it that way, but February 11, 2016 was also the first time that the UN celebrated the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Again, this was just a coincidence, but now February 11 to me means two very special things. And it was really nice. We were on stage um, at the press conference in, in Washington, D.C. There was a simultaneous press conference in, in Italy with Ray Wise and Keith Thorne talking about the science and the history. I was there representing the LIGO scientific collaboration. David Wright is executive director of the LIGO project, but the person presiding the conference was Franz Cordova, the director, she is still the director of the National Science Foundation that funded this project in the US. So I thought it was very appropriate that the woman was presiding, a woman scientist, she's an astronomer, was presiding that. Now, I hope that many of you, even if you have forgotten by now, but many of you now remember how big news this was. This was first page, front page news everywhere. 
And we had a lot of fun looking at the front pages. They all look different. I have here the three I found in Brazilian, 10 minutes, oh, <laughs> in Brazilian papers. The, the global one is a very, one very, uh, very similar to, um, to the New York Times. The, this one had Keith Thorne and Ray Weiss, and this is one of the ones I like the best. And that one, oh, Senor, the universe, for Einstein was actually <laughs> the cutest, I think. Okay, we was the LIGO scientific collaboration. We started in 1997 with about 200, 250 people. We are now 1,200 people. We have close to 100. These are two institutions from, from uh, Brazil here, INPE, which is somewhere in there, and IIP, which is up there from Natal and Sao Paulo. Um, we have many Brazilian members in these institutions. This was the cover of Physical Review published. This is the wave I showed you before. There are two signals in here because there is one signal at Hanford and one signal at Livingston, and you see the same. You see a signal that shows the light going bright and dim, bright and dim, corresponding to two black holes from the frequency we could tell that these were big black holes, not just black holes, black holes that had 29 and 36 solar masses merging into a single one. And when they merged, then the signal stopped. It's a noisy signal, it's a noisy detector, but this is a huge signal for our standards. This was amazing. It took us months to confirm it because that's how science works. You have to be sure before you publish. We had it published, we had it reviewed, and everything went well. Now, I told you that we didn't have the sensitivity we wanted yet, but we were taking data. We were actually preparing to take data because we wanted to do this in phases. We don't want to wait until be perfect before we take any data. We, were, we had been planning to take some data, probably not see anything, but then learn to analyze the data, and improve the detector, and then take more data, and so on. So we were in our first observing run that started in September 2015. That was right when we saw this huge signal. We took data for four months until January 2016. And in December 26, we saw a second signal from smaller black holes. Now, the big black holes produce signals of lower frequencies. Smaller black holes and neutron stars produce signals at higher frequencies. And just to make this a bit more clear, what we did was put this signal onto a speaker. We, these are gravitational waves. I call these the first two notes of gravity symphony. That's a high one. That's a low one. They don't sound very high, right? So we cheated and we added 400 hertz. This sounds a lot better. We dance to this music. <laughs> we took data in 2015. We saw these two signals. We saw a third one that we call a candidate. That wasn't so clear. We went down in 2016 to improve the sensitivity. We did improve the sensitivity, especially of the Livingston detector. We began taking data in November 2000. We were waiting for Virgo detector. I told you that we work together now with Virgo and GEO. We are all, not just one big collaboration, we're still two collaborations, but we work together, we put the data together, we analyze together. And they were not quite operational in 2016, but they were uh, preparing for it. So we were waiting for them. We had this graph that said Virgo will join at the TBD day. We started date, taking data in 2016. January 4th, another black hole merger. Great, we published that. June, we had a fourth black hole merger. By, now, by then, we were saying, this takes so much work to publish. <laughs> Let's just take data, get done with this, until we discover new things. But we had Virgo coming, so that's what was going to be different. We wanted to wait for them and take some data with them. 
they joined August 1st, but we had to go down on August 25th because we had new hardware coming to LIGO, so we had that short window in there. August 14, Virgo joined August 1st. August 14, we see another black hole. But this black hole coalescence now was seen with three, detect with three detectors you can triangulate. A triangulation needs a triangle, needs three corners, at least, actually, the more the better. But now we had three corners. We, for all these detections, we had been telling the astronomers, look there to see if there is anything. But there was a bit large, and these are all black holes, so they don't produce light. So they didn't see anything. There was no significant counterpart that could be claimed. But here, with this fifth black hole, we could say, look there. <laughs> they didn't see anything, but now we were believed a bit more. <laughs> and August 17, just three days later, let me skip this, three days later, we saw a signal, and this one was different because this signal was coming from much smaller stars. These are the black holes we have, and the black holes were all quite bigger than the X-ray black holes, that the other black holes that are known from X-rays. But the one, the, this signal that we discovered on August 17 had masses, if they were black holes, they were only one solar mass each. The sum was less than three solar masses. So these were very small, the signal was very high, was very long. Not only that, but we learned just within minutes That's our diff and up there is the gamma ray. So now it wasn't just gravitational waves, it was electromagnetic waves. What that meant is that these were neutron stars. When neutron stars collide, they do produce a lot of electromagnetic light. And because we had three detectors, we could tell astronomers look there, and they did, and they saw lots of fireworks. Before that, let me show you the movie. I told you this was going to be a light talk. NASA, of course, makes the best movies, not just in Hollywood, but for real. <laughs> this is actually a visualization of the merger and the light that's emitted, light that is beamed, which is the first one that we saw, but then light that goes in all directions. This kind of light with other telescopes. This is called, in science, a kilonova. I, I call it a kilonova rainbow because it came not just in gravitational waves, but in optical, uh, in optical waves, in X-ray, gamma rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, radio. All these are observations. Well, the, the little lines are times that the telescopes were observing, and the thicker lines and the dots were actual observations of light coming from that spot in the sky that we could tell them it was there because we had three detectors. So this time when we said we did it, it wasn't just the LIGO scientific collaboration and the Virgo collaboration, and we have about a thousand authors in these papers, <laughs> it was also a multi-messenger observation. This paper has about 3,000 authors, <laughs> and this list, long list that you see in there, it's a list of collaborations. This was teamwork, not just among gravitational wave scientists that had been working on these detectors for decades, it was also with astronomers doing all kinds of different astronomy with a very different scientific culture <laughs> that published this. Many Brazilians in there. Um, uh, you mentioned Marcel. Marcel 
is a good friend that, that led the work done by the Dark Energy Survey, which was is one of theirs. But there's also another collaboration called the TORUS collaboration, where TORUS means Transient Robotic Observatory of the South. And it's of the South because this collaboration uses, a strong, um, uses telescopes in Argentina and Chile, and it involves scientists from Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and the United States. So you can see Brazil. There are other Brazilian authors, but these are Brazilian authors of this Southern collaboration. Now, you might have heard that in 2017, there was a Nobel Prize in physics awarded to uh, the two pioneers I talked about, Keith Thorne and Ray Weiss. Barry Barish was executive director of the LIGO project in 97, which actually um, saved it from almost a debacle, <laughs> the organization. He put, it, he put the budget together. We have been kept on schedule and budget since then. Uh, and he also was the one who proposed this larger collaboration, because this could not be done just by Caltech and MIT. This needed not just a US big collaboration, but an international collaboration. And that happened in 97. Uh, because of Barry. And something that I like, to, I, I like very much to see, and I haven't seen in other um, science Nobel Prizes, is that the affiliations of the three laureates were given not as Caltech and MIT, but as LIGO-Virgo collaboration. I know Ray liked that a lot. I'm not sure about the others. <laughs> I'm almost there, the end is near. Can you go to the next slide, please? Is somebody there? Oh, there. So let me tell you about the future. This is imagining the future, just two slides about the future. There's the short-term future and the long-term future. The short-term future has LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA and we are planning to do more of the same. Some people ask, ask me, so what are you going to do now? You discovered gravitational waves. What else is there to do? We didn't build these observatories to discover gravitational waves. We build them to measure gravitational waves and use these as observatories to learn about black holes and neutron stars, and we are just beginning to do that. So this is a plan increasing our sensitivity CAGRA will join the network very soon, as soon as they become operational. We hope that late next year. But this is just the beginning. Can you go to the next slide, please? As I told you in the beginning, there are gravitational waves at many different frequencies. You want more and more sensitivity. So in our frequency band, to look at far black holes and neutron stars, but farther away in the universe, we are already planning about new facilities that will be, of course, more expensive, more advanced, and they will be built by collaborations. So this is an invitation <laughs> to collaborate because that's how we do science now. There are two conceptual ideas. We probably will use two or three or more, but we need networks of these detectors. And then, yes, the last slide before the end. Like I said before, gravitational waves come from many different sources and many Radio astronomy is using these radio waves from pulsars as if it were a galactic interferometer. Imagine that. You don't have a laser, but you have the radio wave coming from the pulsar. If you compare that radio wave with that radio wave, you might see gravitational waves the size of the galaxy. Those would be caused by supermassive black holes and perhaps by the early universe. And to really see the early universe gravitational waves, well, those are the most difficult ones, but we probably will need to see those as an imprint in the microwave spectrum. 
So these are all different technologies, different collaborations, different experiments, all looking for gravitational waves. So there are a lot more news coming from gravitational waves, not just in the next few years, not just from us, but from all of these experiments. I hope that you will be tuned. And the next slide is the end. And thank you for staying this late to listen to me. Temos tempo para algumas perguntas. Eu vou, eu vou fazer uma pergunta por vez. A, a, a Gabriela pediu para não fazer várias e. Uh, hi Gabriela, I, I'm just curious about this the geo observatory that you mentioned. Is it capable of observing any of these uh, gravitational waves? Because it's shorter. It is shorter, and that makes it quite a bit less sensitive. Uh, but we have, uh, but we. We use it for two things. One is to keep it up while the other detectors are down, like now, because if there is a supernova in the galaxy, mm. they might be sensitive enough to see it. You may not need more than one because you have an optical signal. If you have more, mm. better, but at least we have one. Mm. So we keep that operational while the others are down. Mm. But also, we have been testing the technologies first there before installing them in LIGO. Uh, that's technologies for the laser and for the suspensions were developed in, uh, were tried first in geo, then we tried some quantum techniques called squeezing the vacuum. Sounds mysterious, but we, were, we have been doing that in geo for years. We are doing that in LIGO. So it's a pipeline testing for the technology. It's very important for us. Is this a timeline for, for the LISA when it's going to, it's still far away in the future? <laughs> There is a timeline. Uh, it's a third large project approved by the European Space Agency. It has a launch date of 2034. We hope it's going to become shorter, but that's space experiments. It's long-term planning again. Luis? <laughs> Gabriela, um, I would like to know how long does it take for gravitational waves to travel through space? <laughs> they travel at the speed of light. At least in theory that, uh, says, we have been testing that to some extent, especially with the joint gamma ray and gravitational wave observation. The events that we have seen, uh, the first detection happened 1.3 billion light years away. So that means 1.3 billion years ago in the Earth multicellular organisms were just getting organized. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, exciting uh, uh, subject. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a far out question, but you know, when you, when you do radio telescopy or you know, with radio waves, you get, you measure correlation functions, uh, and even intensity correlations. And from that you get information on the star, say. Is it too far out to think about measuring correlation functions of the signals you, you have observed? And from that, get the information, more detailed information on the black hole. I mean, the statistics of the signals. Eh? It's, it's not far out. Let me first say that we don't quite, well, we, I, I'm not a radio astronomer. I'm not in that project, in those projects, but again, we all work together. Um, but in, with radio astronomy, these are very, very slow periods. These are periods of many hours to a year. <laughs> so they, they don't measure quite the correlation. They measure the temporal variation and then see whether it is the same for different pulsars. Uh, but yes, there is a method being proposed by one of the Brazilian scientists working here. Uh, well, he's one of the people working on this. Uh, stacking to stack different observations. You have to scale them by the mass because if they are different masses, they are different. But if you stack different, different signals, then you might, and you have enough statistics, you might get more information. This will be especially useful for the merger of neutron stars 
because if we have two black, small black holes merging, then we know the final stage is a black hole. But if we have two neutron star merger, merging, the most likely thing that happens is to form a, a black hole. But it might form a strange star, or there might be a period in between. And we wouldn't know that, uh, but this is one of the ways we might be able to tell. Uh, yes. Uh, it's more of a, sociolog uh, 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 of a sociological question, but really, how do you get 3,000 people working together? And why, why don't other sciences get it right? I mean, coming from the biological side, I mean, that just don't, doesn't happen. We have a very comp competition-intensive model. We get like 3,000 people finding each other and, and finding small results, which are usually false, uh, which is a... I don't know, probably not the best model. But really, wh why does it work more smoothly in physics? I mean, it's just a question of having big theories or having different values, or it's just everything so expensive that you have to work that way? I mean, what's your feeling on that? Well, this particular example and several others in high energy physics that are called big science, it's because they are very expensive and they need lots of different specialties, lots of different people working together, and because you cannot reproduce, you, usually you cannot build one or two, but not 10, then you need to make it right. You need to do it right, and you need to have people from the beginning with different ideas, and that's where diversity is very important. You, you want people with coming to the table with different ideas coming from different, um, maybe not different fields, but, but, but different cultures and different boxes. So out of the box really means out of the box. Uh, to, to get the design together, to make sure that you, you build it right, that when it doesn't work in the beginning, so you need to keep improving it and you need to have people working in there. Now the sociology is very complicated. You know, we are 1,200 people, and, and managing that is like managing a village and a small village. And in every small village, there are lots of different conflicts as well as <laughs> relationships Politics. and so on. Uh, when we wrote the detection paper, we took actually while we were vetting the data to make sure that there was no mistake in there, and that took quite a while. We actually had a team writing, uh, a paper writing team, uh, and they were taking opinions from everybody. We had a thousand authors, and we had about three thousand opinions about each paragraph <laughs> in the paper. <laughs> so that kinds of things were difficult to to balance. But we do it because we are all after the final goal in all these very small steps. And we divide ourselves in working groups. Um, there are actually our, some of our discussions have been summarized before the discovery and after the discovery by a sociologist who had been studying us. For, and yes, he's a sociologist. I was about to say an anthropologist, but he's a sociologist <laughs> um, working in the in the UK. And his name just escaped me, but. Uh, he has published several books about us because he has been living with us for about 15 years now. Oh, thank you for the exciting talk. That's quite inspiring. Uh, actually, my question has to do with the one Luis made. Uh, so, I, I don't know how how long you the time takes to take to take the data and make statistics and things like that. But from your answer. Uh, to Luis' uh, question, it seems that by using those signals, you can now, maybe not now, but maybe in future, fully characterize different holes. And uh, is that is that the future? Yeah. Well, of course, it becomes easier as you make the detectors more sensitive, and the signal to noise ratio is larger. So one big signal might give you more detail than ten smaller ones put together. We have to see. We have only five <laughs> black hole mergers so far, and one neutron star merger. So we don't have statistics yet, but we are betting on improving the sensitivity of our detectors. We think that's the best bet to get large signals. In the meantime, we'll do whatever we can. It, we can tell the masses of the black hole, for example, relatively well. We cannot tell quite yet 
the spin of the black holes, especially before merger. The spin after the merger, we can tell. The spin before the merger, it's, it's difficult. That is something that we hope to get from statistics or from one or two very big signals. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Um, does another uh, gra large gravitational corpses uh, alter the the, gra the the gravitational waves passing through them? And if they do, uh, how do you can say for sure that the the, the wave that you they measured uh, is exactly from uh, black holes uh, that that's, that they have these ex specific masses and these specific collision? Thank you. Yes. Well, gravitational waves go through everything. Yes. <laughs> so it's it's actually nice for me to think that on September 14 we didn't know, but this gravitational wave was making distances between all of us shorter and longer, <laughs> like like I described in the beginning. How do we know? Um, well, uh, in principle, from Einstein's theory, and uh, actually for these systems we need to solve them on computers, the, the first part you can solve more or less with pen and paper, but the last part you need computers. Um, from the frequency and how fast it's growing, you can tell the masses. From the amplitude of the signal, compared to what you know the amplitude was at the, at the source, you can tell the distance. So those are the main parameters. The spins, which are the more difficult one, come from small modulations on the signal. And for that, we need the noise is still a limitation. Just a last question. Then you mentioned several times Yes, uh, I showed that graph with what we had achieved with the initial, the noise we had measured in initial LIGO and the sensitivity that we want, the, the noise that we aim to get in advanced LIGO. We are not there yet, and that's because the systems are so complex. There are thousands and thousands of feedback loops and mirrors and, and lasers and, and feedback loops, which is a way of measuring where, what the distances are and, and controlling them so the mirrors are where they, we need them to be. Those all like to fight each other. <laughs> and this is, in principle, an engineering problem, and you would think that Everything is solved in engineering, and, and it's not. <laughs> we need actually engineers and physicists working together, identifying all these little problems and, and correcting it and making that loop less noisy and this loop less noisy. That is what takes years. But in the meantime, we are also developing technologies. The smaller groups, the smaller experimental groups in the collaboration are developing technologies um, to improve the sensitivity of the detectors. We need the Brownian motion to be less. For that, we need a way to coat the mirrors to be less, less, um, less lossy. Um, for that, we are collaborating with the optics industry. Um, we, we need, uh, we are thinking about for, for new facilities, we're thinking about going underground, Cagra is underground, we're thinking about perhaps going cryogenic, Cagra is cryogenic, so we will be learning from their experience. Uh, we need, we, there are ways, at least that we can imagine, imagining the future, <laughs> we can imagine about measuring seismic noise and canceling it instead of uh, attenuating it, we just measure it well and subtract it. That has not been done, but could be imagined. Uh, we are manipulating the quantum nature of the laser to beat the high frequency noise. So we work on all those technologies in parallel with taking data and with the hardware that's installed in there. Okay, I would like to thank Professor Gonzalez once more for this very inspiring talk.